this is the last uh, webinar of the year, isn't it? Is that right? Last one in the series of the series. Yeah. How many? Nine or ten? Yeah. I think, is this the night? Is this ten? Ten. Okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there we are. Yeah. Um, webinar. Yeah. So. Uh, so that's good. So we we thank you for those of you that have joined any of the others this year, and thanks so much for for coming back. Uh, we really we really appreciate it. Um, and uh, it's been great to have uh, to have this conversation with different people uh, through the year and focus on some of the things that we're really passionate about. And uh, the topic today is at the core of that because it's about lived experience and listening to people. And uh, we've got some uh, core relational activists, um, some real special team members today on the call. And uh, so um, Rich and myself, I think you know us, but we we could introduce ourselves, couldn't, couldn't we, Rich? Um, and then yeah. particularly for people that are new on the call today, thank you if you haven't joined before, you're very welcome. And uh, so my name's Tim Fisher, and I'm a social worker. I work um, in the London Borough of Camden. And uh, we also do other things, research projects, get involved in other stuff, because uh, um, you know, I'm really interested in changing the child welfare system um, and moving towards um, more advocacy, more family conference, and more ways of listening to people and working with people in, in community. Yeah. And um, yeah, we, we when did we first start doing these webinars, Rich? Was a little, we did some last year, didn't we? It was last year. We did a few last year, didn't we? And this year. So we did three or four last year. We just ran them individually it, it, taking topics that picked up kind of fancy and then this year we tried to be a bit more systematic and re really our intention is that, that there's a series of ideas and uh set or i suppose philosophical underpinnings that influence our approach and, and we just wanted to create a forum in which we can share and, and spread some of those ideas as freely and clearly and hopefully as coherently as we can and so um that's really the the, the purpose of these webinars and if um you can access the previous webinars on the relational activism website or um if the, if you ever wanted to get in contact with us please yeah feel free to, to to reach out because we're we're pursuing these ideas both in our own work in our you know respective local authorities but also in, in other places and um uh activating lived experience is is um is a kind of key pillar of i suppose some of the ideas underpinning what it means to be a relational activist and uh and it and it's activating lived experience it, it, it's been a journey for me i wouldn't say that it's something that i've naturally taken to i suppose a few years ago i went to uh, an event in london with tim that tim was hosting and I was just kind of blown away by the the integration of professional um, with, with you know lived experience in, in the same place in the same space, and and how different the dialogue was when that was allowed to take place. And so I was kind of really inspired and um, by by that. And so I thought this is this is a way forward that can fundamentally help us help children and families that's what i'm especially interested in is i don't i don't like ideas for the sake of ideas sake i just i like ideas that that fundamentally help us in our role to to help children and families and i think activating lived experience is definitely one of those so um, yeah that's well said rich and although um, in these webinars we've tried to share our experience and our perspective as people that are working inside local authorities and we're by no means saying that we hold all of the knowledge and one of the key things for us is that you know, we can find leadership in different places uh, and we can most certainly learn um, from people where we're working within our own local authorities and other brilliant people nationally that are really making a difference and speaking their truths um, and helping us all learn um, about this stuff and uh, we've got two, two of those people on the call today um, and uh, one of those is uh she changed it the other day. Palmer, and I can see her on on screen there. Um 
How are you doing, Carmen? Hi. Hi, everyone. I'm good. Yeah. Uh, I, so... know, I know I'm mentioning it all the time, but you're um, you're sporting your new um, supersonic uh, haircut. I think it looks <laughs> fabulous framed with your book down there today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so yeah, hi, hi everyone. Um, Carmen's here, so I'm the one who keep bombarding you guys with emails, tweets, and everything. So I'm um parent with live experience, and I'm live experience uh, parent advocate for uh, work for Camden Council, and I'm also facilitate helping team uh, run the family advisory board. And I'm also peer researcher with uh, universities uh, uh, doing some research at the moment. Yeah, so that's me. Thank you, Carmen. I um, really appreciate that. Maybe I'm focusing on your hair because I'm having a bad hair day at the moment and you're, you're sort of balancing that out somewhat by bringing some quality to the call. Um, Jordel, how are you doing? I'm good, Tim. Yeah. Hi, everybody. And you're bringing some significant uh, learned experience, professional experience uh, to this yeah. and different, different roles and, and also some lived experience as well, it's fair to say. Yeah. So I have um, lived experience with like um, advocating for myself, advocating for other family members and um, professional experience, doing it professionally with the local authorities and other um, London boroughs. Yeah. Thanks, Jordan. Well, could I ask um, a, a quick question about that in terms of, because now you're on this, I suppose, this side of the fence. And I just wondered if you had any reflections on previously when you've been in that position yourself or when you were supporting other family members, were you perceived differently to how you're perceived now when you're in this kind of quasi-professional position? And what was that like for you? Definitely, yeah, I I am and I was. Um, being a advocate for myself, I felt that I'm quite strong at advocacy. I'm quite strong at advocating for myself and what I want and being quite clear with my objective and I'm quite communicative where other people aren't. And I found that even as good as I was, when it was about me, I felt that there was like a real fragment or disengage with my objective and the way that the professional or the organization received me. Mm. Um, and I had to do a lot of follow-ups through email, quite strong emails, just to show how powerful this communication can be. When I do it for families, I find that um, a lot of the pressure that they would feel is taken off of them. Like I've got scenarios in my mind where I've been in like professional meetings, like CP conference, and I can feel the dad um, feeling provoked by the wording, how the social workers kind of described things in the CP conference. And I intervened to kind of be that like deflection and mm. be that voice of um, upset or dissent about something. And I think that helped family look better overall because by not having an advocate or having me in the room I think he would have just fell into the narratives that was already being described um and I acted as like a mediator to be the bearer of bad news or the one that looks bad because it doesn't bother me you know mm -hmm. I could I can look like that I know what the family's position is or whoever I'm advocating for is and I know what it feels like to be misconstrued or your words be mis like manipulated and kind of being judged you know and i'm not on trial at the moment i have no emotion to it so i think it's 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 a little bit easier as well to be the professional more so than being the person involved sometimes it's quite hard to advocate for yourself yeah it's um it's making me think a little bit about the level of heightened emotion that you experience when you're on the receiving end of um services uh, and and how so even for me it was like difficult to comprehend or empathize with parents and the predicament or the position that they're in sometimes because I was trying to handle my own fears or insecurities and anxieties about 
for example, being in a child protection conference for the first time or oh. whatever situation we might be in. So I think you've yeah, articulated that tension really well. Thank you. Mm. And I and as well, like when I've done advocacy before, just like going off of this in a professional aspect, I've been in scenarios where there's like because of how because there's emotion involved when it's about your child or your family or your immediate family, um, as I said, your words get misconstrued. And I've been an advocate for some individuals where I've been able to rebuild that relationship because they're unable to advocate what they're saying without the passion, you know, because they care, it's about their life. And because it's not my my life and I'm kind of detached from the scenario, I can still advocate what they want or explain what they want in a more professional, friendly way. Mm-hmm. And the whole outcome is is more kind it's more kind of family focused in opposed to being um family v professional. Yes, I think that's that's really fascinating, Jordan. And we've got some themes. We put some themes on on slides, and I think this first one is getting at uh, the journey or the the arc of what's been happening here. In that, I think we started thinking about Camden and some of the work we do. We started listening and mm-hmm. feeling that it was important to listen to people. And then working with them, we started the coffee morning 10 years ago to hear from people and then started working on projects um, and co-designing. And where, where it feels we've landed at the moment, and there'll be others on the call that are looking at this, of developing uh, ways of working with people, or perhaps looking at peer parental advocacy as well, which is very current and, and is in the government uh, guidance and there are recent funding calls through the DfE for uh, parental representation uh, and programs and projects and ideas around parental representation. Um, we've landed where the lived experience is active in the system, uh, providing advocacy, trying to come alongside parents that need support. Um, and so this 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 title that we've given this webinar about acti- activating lived experience, I mean, t- tells a story, tells a story of um, parents and also young people as well uh, getting involved and uh, and and then contributing to the um, to the system. Um, and that we feel really is at the heart of the relational activist ethos as well um that uh, in a relational activist is somebody that can uh, work with empathy and compassion and uh, connect and form networks and and form relationships uh, and work with people that is not just in one direction uh, it's not just about you know working to the rule of um, your manager or a vertical system about reaching out to to people in different ways and finding allies um, and people that can help uh, and connecting with the connecting with the community um, and valuing that as well. Um, how do you look at it from your perspective, Rich, in the local authority that 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 you work in? You just began to to say how it's feeling for, for for you over time to start listening. Where do you think? Where do you situate yourself in that journey? Um, well, I suppose, like I said at the beginning, I've I've been on a a journey or an evolution in, in terms of how my thinking's changed in relationship to listening, because it can be quite challenging when you're a child protection social worker, because you face a lot of criticism or 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 there's a lot of kind of distrust and hostility that's built into the relationship, and part of that it is. Um, it's it's almost an unavoidable consequence because no matter how um, compassionate or skilled or sensitive you try and be as a social worker, fundamentally you're a representative of a statutory organisation that has the potential to remove somebody's child. And so that's always going to be in the back of the mind of a, of a parent when you're trying to collaborate and build a relationship with them. And um, 
and so l- l- listening is an opportunity i suppose to think about what how we could operate differently even within the confines of what we're expected to do as statutory social workers and and i really like jordell's point about being a mediator between the social worker and the parent because i always because my sense is that there's always going to be limitations to what the social worker is able to do because there is going to be that built-in fear and that built-in distrust. And so the, the advocate is well positioned to say, look, this isn't their intention. This is what they're trying to achieve. They might not be using language that's particularly helpful, but that this is the position that the social worker is coming from. And then likewise, they can, as Jordell kind of illustrated in his example, um, help the help the family articulate what they would like to happen or what they would like to see be done in a way that doesn't aggravate or upset the, the professionals and um uh and so it's about yeah how can we form more collaborative um re- relationships with everybody involved so that fundamentally children can grow up healthier and happier mm-hmm. but that but the, the reason why i'm saying that is because that begins with initially listening to to parents and um, and giving them a space to share some of their their, their grievances or dissatisfaction yeah. with the system. I think um, listening super important because um, we always say, uh, "Well, we we ensure parents' voice is heard," but now actually, how many people are actually listening? with intense, you know, and, and I think most of the time the, it is, um, communication breakdown. That's, that's not, no, no one actually listening. What, what is the bottom line of the persons telling you in front of you, telling you what are they actually saying? Um, so, um, very often, um, sometimes social workers, they, they do, they do have um make their own decision in their mind, despite the person telling them something that was happened to me at the beginning. But uh so I was lucky that um the other social worker came after they actually uh, listened to me. Mm-hmm. We have a conversation, so um So they, she, she was curious. And so what I'm actually telling her, try to understand. So we, we, we need to, I think we need to, when when you're supporting people, you want to make change, we, we need to understand the person deeply, what they're actually telling you. Um. So I think it's the, the perspective sharing and perspective learning so it's kind of like the the fab group that that we're doing in this space so that we parent can share and social worker can learn and we we in this space that that we we build it trust and empathy towards each other um so to also uh, enhance this this relationship make us uh, more tight and to work together to to achieve this um better outcome so that that was for me listening is super important in in this space can you say the relationship can you say carmen um would you mind saying what what happened in your situation and and you know that wow that so so from from yeah yeah, yeah. from my my story was uh, uh when i experienced this dv situations and um, then when social worker came in, I thought, oh, they they come to rescue, come to help me in my situation. So I told her everything. And um, then end up I, I got betrayal. I felt that it is a betrayal because she 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 used everything I told her to create her own stories to against me in the court. Um then very quickly my son's been removed within uh within 10 days. So this, the next day she had applied the interim care order. So if, within 10 days, then my son's been removed. So, and she's not listened. 
she she's not listen well she she listens something i think then to get the hints to to put her own story together to support what what her agenda was but that's not what it actually happens does not the truth so um at the beginning i i, I have no confidence uh, or trust with the first social worker so it, it was really bad i think but um i thanks for her her conduct to now I reflect I, I thought actually I'm thank you for what she did to me otherwise I wouldn't be brave and stand up for myself and talk and speak and doing everything that I'm doing now so yeah this is uh, my my experience with, with them but obviously I, I as I said the social worker came after after her they will um i think they 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 curious they they like to they want to know uh what they can do to help me to support me so it is get to um other points i i think is how uh people do do they do reflections i think parents and social worker professional every time Every day, they, they need to go home to reflect on their conduct, what they did today. Are they, in that situation, did I contribute to make change to this, in this situation, have positive contributions, you know? Um, are we, am I adding value to, to these persons in front of me? Are we working together to, to make this, um, this situation uh, uh, better? But what I see is most of the time people are in very hostile situations. Like parents is not like the social worker that is like they are always having this war with the social worker and social worker uh, um distrust the parents and then it's like constantly in, in this hostile situation, I think it, it doesn't it wouldn't go anywhere. Mm. So we need to learn to reflect. And yeah. then work together. Yeah. Um. So this is the only way that you can work with people. So therefore, I think um the parent advocates is important in the middle to to support to help both sides to understand what is it. And we're gonna come and we're gonna talk directly about the uh, the parent advocacy. And yeah, I think that, <clears throat> that's really important. And partly this, I mean, it's thinking about the individual social work and parent relationships and reflecting on that context um, and the difficult context sometimes but also these webinars and what rich and i are trying to bring is um, some ideas about how we can facilitate how we can open up spaces how we can provide um space to share mm. uh, stories and one of the things that i feel has helped along the way is being able to acknowledge and fundamentally acknowledge that the system does do harm uh, sometimes um, and that's really what you're in, um, expressing there i think that's important uh, you know um listening with empathy and acknowledgement is um is different to um listening without uh, that allowing that to influence uh, allowing that to influence you as a professional um some of you might have seen this um uh i'm sure lots of you on the call would know brené brown who's a social work professor uh, coming out of texas and uh, she talks a lot about shame and vulnerability and connection and um here's a nice clip from her to get us uh, to get us thinking and to build on what carmen and jordel have said about shame and how it affects the way they live, love, parent, work, build relationships. I finally, for the first time in probably in my career, understand why. If you think about connection, um, and I talk a lot about connection in my work. Connection is our ability to forge meaningful, authentic relationships with other people. 
I believe that connection is the essence of the human experience. Um, it is what breathes lives and gives meaning to our lives. If you think about connection on a continuum, what I have learned is that anchoring this end of that continuum is empathy. It is what moves us toward deep, meaningful relationship. On the other side of the continuum connection is shame. It absolutely unravels our relationships and our connection with other people. Yeah, there we go. Um, how does that, how would you respond to that, Rich? Yeah, I definitely uh, resonate with the, with the idea of shame being a kind of underpinning um, feature, I suppose, of, of many of the parents that, that we've worked, that I've worked with anyway. And I know that um, Matthew Gibson's done some really interesting work about the, the, the role of shame and um, how it can compromise or undermine the development of um, of relationships, uh, and, and I couldn't agree more really in terms of connection and um, and I suppose again th this is why I'm so optimistic or excited by the prospect of uh, activating lived experience or, or or parental advocacy as a kind of shoot off from that is that it, it can facilitate our ability to generate connection and um uh, uh, and, and relationship to others and uh carmen i i've heard you talk about to shame before to address that to address that directly um you know it's a fundamental human response uh to um uh, to 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 those situations. Um, did that did that chime with you? What Brené Brown says there, Karma? Are you? You're on mute, Karma. Yeah, you're on mute. Yeah. Yeah. Now I can. Yes. Mm. Yes. Shame is a lot of shames, obviously, um, because. In in the domestic abuse situations, like um, people often uh, questions, oh, why that person's not leaving? Uh, is it really easy to criticize and 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 say why you don't do such and such? You know, but when you are actually in that situation, you just can't. It it it, it just it's frozen because most of the people, I think. They are in a frozen mode. They they just can't can't do a lot of stuff without um people supporting. So, but when that um it came out of the shells in into the light um uh, or that people now understood, but then and that pe person is not actually supporting and criticizing you. So I got punished for being the victim, right? And then my son also uh, punished by being the victim. So what is this? And um, I think it, it just reinforced that that shame on on top of you like oh so this is my fault and 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 this is what happened. And I I this is why people don't tell the others when they are in problems and and that this is why people suffer and and stay in the situation so because of all this that what they heard that oh you wouldn't be support but you will be punished so i think that that is the problem um but after uh i well that was my my thought in in the periods when i was in that situation but after uh these past 10 years i gone through the storm and and working with the professional and the other people in the field so i think um despite we have the the motive to do good stuff good things for, for with people but the way it just is outdated and it's not working can, um, can you say, can you say to, Colin, sorry to, sorry to cut you there just do you, can you say yeah. you've got there, that theme of like shared spaces 
and you've been involved in a lot of shared spaces talking in groups you now run yeah what you might so because you think we need to change Yeah. yeah so when we need to change things and i think um we we need to tell our stories people need to tell their stories to to inspire to inspire the change because if people just keeping to themselves then then nobody knows what's happening so i think this is why um we need to value um people with lived experience we need to listen to their lived experience and know i mean everyone's stories are different they have but different contests and stuff um but are uh, we listen so are we really um inspired by what they've been through um to make efforts to to help this change can i can i just jump in quickly yeah go for it yeah. um take your time yeah i was i was gonna say about um shame culturally as well it's a big thing um, social intervention is not something some cultures experience or something they want to experience or something they're familiar with and it's one of those things that we're quite weary of especially from my culture it's social intervention what is that very unfamiliar to us everything's dealt within the home in the most modest and private of ways you know and and as an internal family we will deal with it um, never does it reach the threshold for an external party to come in and kind of scrutinise you. And I think that's another thing that's quite important with advocacy is that sometimes social workers are quite fixed in their regime of experience and having that intermediate person that can kind of balance the two who has lived experience or knows what actual life might look like for a single mother of three kids that has one going primary school, one that's like breastfeeding and one that's in secondary school um, can kind of create a bit more a lot more balance, to be honest. And another thing I was going to say about that is about um, messages, you know. Sometimes it's it's not the message, it's the messenger. I could be saying exactly the same thing to the social worker for the past three, four weeks and having the advocate come, and because they're detached from emotion and they say it, the social worker or the professionals are just a little bit more perceptive or receptive to what's being said. And for me, it shouldn't have to always be that, you know, but it is that that's the reality. And having the advocates or having someone support as a peer or having someone support as a professional um, in like the role I do, I, I've I've taken things in a new extreme for myself. Like I I studied a whole law degree to make sure that my my advocation was on job. I'm so focused on my objective that nothing will deter me. Um, but just to say, like, that's how extreme I went. So my letters became quite strong quite quickly. <laughs> you know, I was I was um, referencing case law and this and that. And, yeah, they didn't know who they was messing with, you know. And I don't look like how my mind is. Like, I'm quite, quite clever, you know. And that's what I like is that you perceive, you might perceive me in a way, and like how you perceive a family in a way and not actually know how layered that person is or what's actually behind them, you know? And that's the art of advocacy. You underestimate the families, like social workers or professionals, underestimate families or look at them with, with like, uh, through, like, tinted glasses. And that's not the way. Yeah. I know. I, I think, the, by the way... Um, you look as sharp as anything, as sharp as a whip to me. <laughs> you know, by the way, <laughs> but um, and I, I, I think is yeah. There's um, curiosity is a word. I think Carmen used it earlier. It's a very good word, and uh, there is a a cur- I think the system overall has got a curiosity and a sort of impulse to assess and ask questions, um, but you know that they're, they're not. Um, that might not be the same thing as really. Um, having that imaginative curiosity to re- re- to to really recognise uh, somebody um, and to um, really take on board their, their 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 lived experience expertise and that that phrase professional vulnerability is a good one one I've been thinking about recently because it means then that I can actually change my view uh, and I, there's an allowance there for for hearing from you. 
and to um uh, and and hearing that different knowledge that you're bringing and that expertise that you're bringing um and uh, and then i think that process of genuine learning exchange um can really generate hope and can help us um um can help us move forward and we've got um another little film here so this is vicky reynolds and uh she is a a writer a therapist a systemic writer and i'll play this little clip of um vicky reynolds talk as we get towards uh, generating hope but i think the thing you know we're taking on is objectivism and neutrality is a particular position and it's siding with a lot of social injustice and so that you know if we're going to do our work in ways that are in line with our ethics we're actually going to have to work to change the social context of injustice so I think therapist as activist, frontline worker as activist, that that's nothing to be ashamed of or to hide, and that we try to get our disciplines to embrace that as actually an ethical requirement. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so Vicki Reynolds then, in some of her other writing, she talks about building teams of solidarity or solidarity teams. And she's talking there about herself as a therapist and other professionals that share her values also people from community, people with lived experience um, and allying them with those groups to try and make the change uh, locally. And she might be talking about social change on a, on the large scale um, and wearing your heart on the sleeve about, about social um, issues, about the crippling context of poverty. But she's also talking about solidarity and making progress in our everyday actions and trying to take steps forward and work with people um, which makes things uh, better uh, and makes a difference and I know there's something I've really always admired in your your work Rich is getting on the front foot and taking the next step and sometimes um, you know taking a, a relational risk as a professional uh, to reach out and try and get a piece of work going yeah, it's making me think of when we were inspired by um, the work that has been done in Camden, where I work in Baines, to set up a parental advocacy group. And um, there was lots of thinking and planning and strategizing and seeking. And, um, and and months and months had gone by and, and we still hadn't made contact with a parent or sat in a room with them. And then, and then it just reached a point where we really wasn't going to be able to do anything until we just made contact and we um, um, we and we made ourselves vulnerable to meeting up and it and it going wrong and um but but we couldn't take it any further you know just on a piece of paper or or by you know making it you know academizing it or that isn't even a word but th 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 there is a point where you just have to get on the phone to a parent and say you know what's been your sense of social work involvement or inviting them into a room with a group of other parents and and um and it and it does require a degree of um of vulnerability and um courage in some sense because not everything that they're going to share is going to be positive and so um it's about opening up the dialogue but one of the things that i do think is really interesting is that what once you get together it becomes much clearer that we have similar objectives and aims and um and and there's uh opportunity for, for for collaboration there um that isn't always obvious when we're locked into the pre-existing role of social worker and family yeah uh, agreed and do you th that line at the top it's one that our uh, colleague and friend related activist becca dove uh, talks about a lot which is and surfacing power and uh, I think it's speaking to the point that perhaps sometimes talking about sharing power is disingenuous or unrealistic working in that statutory context um, but we can be clear and um, transparent about the power that's there uh, and try and work together with with people um, I th that line about remade identities I think this is a fascinating one and you know, Jordell talking about his his law degree and his unique uh, mix of um, lived and learned experience, a, a CV of working with 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 people as long as you're arm, and also the lived experience and the and the academic. So there's as we move through in our lives, and also 
the engagement that people who lived experience have with the local authorities and research organizations those identities change and those roles change and um, i mean carmen at the moment you've got many hats haven't you and including you're doing uh, peer research around um, advocacy and and family youth conference and um how's that felt to sort of pick up to pick up different roles and and chat and as you felt your identities changed over time and how you feel about yourself oh Sorry, I'm like uh, i know i tell i tell you what we've got another little um we've got another final little film yeah. let's play that and then we'll give a uh, clown come a chance to come in um so uh, this is just a little um, a summary from some clips from our, our films and events. And we're going to be having another event um, in uh, Valentine's Day again in February. So I'd really love all of you to to come along to that. Uh, but um, I look out in particular for for Anna Gupta here, Professor Gupta, and what she says about people. Trust. Hey, they look so long, they probably start thinking it must be love. Or something like it. To love is to act, you know. See that person for who they are and just say, listen, we're here to look at the way forward. If you don't believe that person, if it's as a social worker, you don't believe that person in front of you or sitting in the class from you is equal to you, there is no way you can practice recognition and respect. In the middle. There you go. Yeah, Carmen, sorry, you you were going to come in, I think. You've unmuted. Yeah, so um, what what was your question? <laughs> um, <laughs> I guess I was, I was into, I was, I was. What's your question, Tim? But, <laughs> <laughs> need, Rich, can you help me out? I need an advocate. Can you ask a better question? <laughs> um, I think like the the different hats you wear, you wear. How, uh, okay. that, how does that feel? I guess. In this idea about m movement and moving together, mm. and it, it talks to mm. me, picking up the Vicky Reynolds thread about social movement, about activism. There's mo there's there's movement in that sense, but there's also the mo individual yeah. moves that we make as individuals. And you've grown into new areas, uh, and um and, yeah. and and really from this sort of static position of being somebody like you know a service user and a, a service user then that's providing yeah. feedback and you've moved into new areas and sort of how has that felt along the way? I think uh, this is the, the process of healing. It's a long process of healing to, to understand um, what I, I, I experience. Because in in the chaos of the the incidents of of, of those times, um, as I told you before, it, it was frozen in a frozen bit. But when we came out, so I think you remember that that practice that that um that formulas that to feel and deal and heal, and then um, and it's like the those postcard from our friends. Seth, yeah. that what just happened? We we need to know what what happened to us. So then, in the process, then I start to know what happened to me, and um, to realize what happened. And then he said, "What do you want to happen next?" And then, "What do you think will happen next?" So there is a lot of reflections and 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 learning. To understand myself, like uh, healing and growing, and um, so also understand what's happened, and then I can now use this experience into um, good to to support other people, right? So, and this morning I read a quote, and it said, and. Um, if you don't heal yourself, you can't uh, uh, really uh, uh, support with other people, truly. So I think this is this is important. Um, in this movement, people being hurt, p 
people have all this experience, very negative. But but while we we transitioning, we we healing the process in healing, um, we are now able to to do all these things. So therefore, this is these two terms: the live experience and live expertise. So I think I gone through the least experience bit rather than keep talking about my my experience. But I through this healing and doing all these different things as a least ex expertise with this experience to do uh um to do well to to this movement and this development of uh, of parent advocacy work, and to um, support people. So I think I'm from 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 the the victim to survivor, survivor until to as a learner, and now become a healer. I will see the parent advocacy work as a healer to to support other people to heal from from their their trauma. Yeah. Am I make sense? <laughs> yeah, um, that makes complete sense. I'm just going to um, unmute Tim a sec. And, and um, mm -hmm. it reminds me, actually, um, we've just had some research published that myself and um, Clive Diaz and Sammy Fitz Reynolds was involved, um, Sammy Fitz was involved in, and um, which is available. It's called... Um, Peer Parental Advocacy and Narrative Review of the Literature, and it's in the Journal of Children's Services. If um if you can't access it, just email me and I'll and I'll get a copy to you. But basically, one of the key ideas is this to how you can the, the opportunity to be involved in giving feedback and then transcending into maybe being of service to others, it, it has like a transformative effect on the self. And 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 they can come, they can you can journey your way through being on the receiving end to then be in part of the service that helps other parents through that similar position or predicament themselves. And that it that role in of itself um can 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 aid growth and development and create new opportunities as uh, I mean Carmen's testament to that really. Yeah abs absolutely and I, I saw there was a question sorry it started to be across the thread um the, the chat thread there that uh, I saw a question about incentives for for parents with lived experience and uh, for the advocacy and we've got information about the our advocacy on on the website um, on the relational activism website uh, parents are paid and uh, so Jordell and Carmen are paid and the uh, work that we do facilitation work the events that we do for presentations and facilitation um, we are um, we are uh, paying people, so we have that we have that principle, and it's emotional labour, isn't it, to use that kind of phrase, and it, it and it is important that that's that's recognised, and that contribution that contribution is is recognised, and and peer advocacy, Clive has, and and Rich and others have embarked on a bigger a research program, and 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 Clive Diaz is pretty sure that the parent advocacy is will save money you know we'll save local authorities money um because you know the, the cost of it that it is to take a child into care um if some quality help and some advocacy can be provided um earlier in the life of of of, of problems in community um then uh, that's good for everybody um we feel uh, i've dropped some links in the chat me and Rich are in, in Birmingham uh, in, uh, just at the start, right at the start of November. And if anybody's interested um, in, in joining that, you can join online. It's free. And to join online, so there's a link there. Uh, we've got our uh, mailing list. So if you go to the website, you can sign up for the, for the mailing list. And also we started putting some, some videos out there. And I just dropped that uh, one in the... Uh, in the chat and uh, so in any if anybody's interested in coming on board and engaging with the comments and things on on the videos and we can further the, the dialogue and uh, we use this as a space to invite people on and to give them the time to unfold their thoughts and to give us an idea 
uh, about their uh, role in the system. But there are other spaces that we facilitate where we can have more direct dialogue with people. So if anybody's interested, uh, then do um, get in touch with us. Uh, Jordell, did you have some uh, uh, close, closing uh, thoughts for us? Thank you for really fascinating uh, contributions in this in this hour. I've really enjoyed listening to you. Thank you. Yeah, some final thoughts? Mm, there was something I wanted to say with what you were saying. And then... <laughs> it's gone, gone uh, on vacation <laughs> but it's okay yeah the magic will come back <laughs> um yeah. I'm, I'm just saying that advocacy is, is advocacy is quite keen i'm sorry quite key in in many oh i remember it was something to do with um pay consultants and stuff i, I say in being a being a through my lived experience i know that during the process of specific things i went through there was this feeling of isolation, like no one you could talk to about it, no one you could confide in. The professionals, you want to speak to them, but they're not here for you. They're here to just weaponize what you say to them. So um, just to kind of reinforce the, the importance of like the paid experience and having that person there, sometimes it's just as a confidant, just to speak to them about what you're going through and offload like how you're finding the process as a listening friend. That in itself is sometimes the biggest value, just having someone that's not judging you and that's just on your side. Or, yeah, that that I, I just wanted to kind of say that. Um, that's quite important through the CP processes and all the stuff. That's a really, that's a really strong, a really strong message. Thank you, Dordell. And uh, on, we do have a, we had a webinar earlier in the year, if you didn't see it on, Parent advocacy, uh, where um, Jordell and Carmen talk in more detail about their role and encourage people that are interested to um, to take a look at that. Uh, Carmen, did you have some uh, final words for us? Thank you so much for taking us on that journey with you and talking so uh, insightfully about shame and your and your your journey. Uh, Rich needs to un unmute you there. Yeah. Um, there we go. So. Um... Parent advocacy is not a transactional work, and I believe it's transformation work, and it is um so much deeper than just the words, just the meaning of the words. So um, is 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 changed a person's help them to, to make change, help them to 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 realize uh what's happening in their life and to grow. And I think it is it's like before I said it's a healing journey, it's also a uh, um grow in, in different ways as a person or spiritual or anything. Um but we we are not the same there to to take the the hello. We are the person who have this experience to to support another person working with them yes to encourage other parents so i think um people are not alone and there are people who, uh be with you and will support you go through your journeys and i hope that's my visions that i want other local authority be able to see this the benefit of this and um, also to no fear of losing power. Nobody try to take their power, but working together and to stop harming people even further. Yeah. Wow. What 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 a brilliant um way to end. Um really encouraging closing remarks for people working inside local authorities who want to progress with this. So yeah, thanks everybody so much. And um, Rich, final. Um, I was just thinking that I was going to wrap up with um, a quote from this book called um, Small Arts of Larger Circles by uh, Nora Bateson, which is actually a book Tim recommended to me. And um, it's it's about leadership, and I think it kind of encapsulates some of the themes that we've talked about today. Um, leadership does not reside in a person, but in an arena that can be occupied by offerings of specific wisdom to the needs of the community. So leadership is produced collectively in the community, not the individual. The individual's responsibility is to be ready and willing to show up, serve, and then most importantly, stand back. 
leadership for this era is not a role or set of traits. It is a zone of interrelational processes. Step in, step out. By definition, leadership is needed when something has to be done that has never been done before. Meeting unknown circumstances requires rapid learning and spontaneous learning. In the case of today's leadership needs, that learning is mutual. So I just thought that would be a nice place to wrap it up. Lovely. Well, we do, we pride ourselves on finishing on time. Thank you for giving us this hour. We really appreciate it. And um, yeah, and uh, see you again. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Mm -hmm.